Yeah, so uh, welcome to the second uh, lecture, um, which will be by Dr. Antoine Klein. Uh, so Antoine did uh, his uh, uh, PhD at Zurich. After that, he has been a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Montana and Mississippi, and now he's a senior postdoctoral fellow at Birmingham. And one uh, unique thing about Antoine is that he has worked across uh, almost every discipline of gravitational waves, starting from waveform modeling and very subtle issues related to waveform modeling, all the way up to LISA and astrophysics related to LISA. So we have got an excellent speaker uh, who will be able to guide us on the second topic related to the gravitational waves. Antoine. Thank you very much. So it's, um, I'd like to thank the organizers to, for, for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be in Bangalore. And, um, uh, and it's a, a pleasure to, to uh, talk about Lisa. So, uh, so the oh, it's not uh, this is not working. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great. Yay! All right. So, so first, I will uh, present a short overview of the of the mission. Uh, what, um, uh, what kind of sources we expect, and, um, uh, and then I will, uh, I will go on to, um, uh, to discuss the, the, the instrument response to the gravitational waves. So if we have a, a gravitational wave uh, coming through, through the instrument, how does it affect the, the different measurements that we make and how, um, uh, uh, and how we can model our sources to, uh, to detect them in the end. Then after that, uh, hopefully tomorrow, I will um, present the, um, a description of the modeling of the noise in the detector. So, um, uh, how different uh, sources affect the, the noise in a detector, uh, and how does it affect the different um, uh, the different ways in which we um, uh, we model the, the response. So after that, uh, hopefully on the third day, I will uh, talk about some. Uh, um, a select, um, a select set of, uh, uh, of studies that have been done to, uh, to quantify how well we can uh, measure uh, sources parameters in LISA for uh, supermassive black hole binaries. So the, the masses, the spins, the uh, sky location, etc. cetera. Uh, and then in the end, I will uh, Talk about some uh, brief. Uh, we'll briefly talk about some um, applications for uh, fundamental physics. So, supermassive black hole binaries. They are uh, one of the most uh, important sources for LISA. Re that's really uh, what the detector was designed to do: is to de uh, detect uh, such binaries. Uh, these will have uh, very long-lived signals uh, with very, very high signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, the most, uh, the, the loudest ones will have um, signal-to-noise ratio up to a few thousand. So, uh, so from the point of view of, um, uh, of waveform modeling, that will be a... Uh, uh, a big, uh, a big challenge to, to model those sources. Uh, but, the, but these signals allow to, re to really go deep into the signal and, and really, uh, really probe uh, different effects that uh, affect the, the waveforms, such as uh, spin precession or uh, uh, measuring multiple ring down modes. Um, at the same time, or uh, eccentricity, um, or different effects like that. Uh, and also, uh, for a supermassive black holes, the signals will be very loud, so we, we will be able to see them 
really, really far uh, up to a uh, redshift uh, of a uh, hundred or so for the um, uh, for for. Uh, for the ideal mass ranges uh, of the detector, so this will, these, the, uh, these measurements will be really, really helpful in order to, uh, uh, to, prove, to probe uh, supermassive black hole evolution models. So here's a, a, a sketch of um, uh, the noise in the detector uh, in here. And uh, different uh, different uh, source types, uh, and how uh, how they appear in the detector at which frequencies. Um, so, first of all, uh, these are uh, supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, so these uh, these signals here, if you, if you look. Uh, uh, if you have a total mass of 10 to the 7 solar masses, these will appear at the low end of the, the frequency band. Uh, a signal of 10 to the 6 solar masses will appear uh, right with the, have the merger right uh, on the bucket of the, uh, of the detector noise. Uh, and even 10 to the 5, you, you'll be able to see them in a, in a really broad um, range of frequencies. Uh, yeah? Is the color mean something? Yeah, so, so, so the, the color is uh, roughly the, the amplitude of the time domain signal, I, I think. And, um, and also how, how early uh, or late you are in the in spiral. So you see that uh, one month before merger, uh, you're here, you're, you're dominated by them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That time scale is different from the initial merger. When are you seeing before the merging event, or what is the color for the image or anything? Yes, so, uh, so, so uh, the, the light part uh, of the curve refers to a, a very early in the in-spiral, so years before the, the merger. No, that's the total mass of the system. It, it's uh, more or less the, the, the final mass, but uh, it's, it's the sum of the two component masses. So the, yes, so, so um, with very very loud uh, with very very loud signals, you will be able to to really detect the the mass ratio very accurately. The 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 typical ballpark ballpark estimate for the mass ratio is about ten to the minus three uh, per second. Per second. Right, so, so, these, so this is only the, the leading order term, so it doesn't, it, it depends very weakly on the mass ratio. So uh, if you change the mass ratio a little bit, that will shift this curve, but not, not by a lot. So. Yeah, that's, the, that's the, 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 the precision of the measurement that you can do uh, in the end, yes, that's about it. Yes. But these are equal mass. Right? These are equal mass binaries, yeah, yes. yes. To, uh, are you talking about extreme mass ratio in spirals? Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're a little bit ahead. So, so that's what uh, these curves here uh, 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 are so so this this is the uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals. So those are systems of uh, one supermassive black hole and one stellar mass black hole orbiting and, um, uh, and merging. So so those systems will be uh, will be very very different. So uh, just <laughs> just one second <laughs> will be very very different. Um, uh, and you see here uh, different harmonics for, for one uh, model signal 
on top of each other. Uh, yeah? Right. So, so, um, uh, so this this all depends on the uh, uh, on the particular shape of the signal. So, a, a supermassive black hole binary with a, a comparable mass ratio. This will have a, a, a specific uh, waveform, and you and you can you can measure the uh, the mass ratio very accurately. So, you will be able to tell. Okay. Uh, my mass ratio is two to one or, or something like that. Uh, and these signals here, um, uh, they will have uh, uh, very different effects that, uh, that affect their, uh, uh, their waveform. So um, uh, just, by the, uh, uh, just by the shape of the signal, you'll be able to, to tell them apart. Uh, yes. Yes, 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 yes. And um, uh, so a third, uh, a third kind of signal is, is the, the galactic binaries. So those are, uh, those are uh, uh, typically white dwarf binaries, uh, very early in the in-spiral. So they're seen as a, a signal that's uh, almost monochromatic. Uh, you also see... Uh, uh, um, you also see uh, neutron star binaries early in the in spiral uh, like that. Uh, and here you, you see a, a, a sea of, uh, of different sources, and those are all uh, resolvable um, sources. So these, these are very close to each other in, in frequency. Uh, but the, the way that we can tell them apart is that uh, the... Um, the, the instrument is, uh, is orbiting the sun. So uh, depending on where the, the galactic binary is located, uh, the signal will be uh, redshifted uh, at some point uh, uh, of the year. And uh, six months six month later, it will be blue shifted. So you can um, uh, disentangle your, your different signals uh, like that. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, yes, the verification binaries, those are uh, bi white dwarf binaries that we have already observed uh, electromagnetically. So, so we know where they are, we know their masses, we know their frequency. Uh, and so we know that their gravitational wave signal will appear in the detector. And uh, some of them will be loud enough that we can detect them very quickly. So, so those are um, a type of binaries that, uh, that we can use to, uh, to, uh, to calibrate our, our detector in some sense. Yes? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know that on, on, on the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> um. Maybe you can just yeah, yeah. You can you can figure that out by using the leading order uh, post-Newtonian term. Two? Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, they're the yes. So they're they're long lived uh, in general. So um, uh, so this one will be observable for a month. This one for a few months. This one for a year, uh, etc. So. So those are long-lived. Um, so what I mean by that is, uh, is in comparison to, uh, to uh, ground-based uh, sources, uh, like in, in LIGO and Virgo, uh, those signals 
typically lasts, uh, 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 lasts for a very short time. So the, uh, the detector is, uh, is almost uh, uh, static in place during the, during the observation of the signal. But for those sources, since these last for months or years, then the, the detector goes all the way around the sun in that, in that time. So the, the response will be affected by, uh, by, this, uh, by this fact. Uh, but those, yeah, those verification binaries, those live for uh, the whole duration of the mission, uh, four or 10 years, depending on the, uh, on the budget. Yeah. Yes. So I think, um, so I'm not 100% certain, but I think this is a 10 to the 6 uh, central black hole with a 10 solar mass uh, companion. Yeah. Mm? Yes, so, so the galactic backgrounds, so those are, um, those are galactic binaries, uh, but galactic binaries with a signal that's too low to be uh, really detectable. Uh, so they, uh, they will provide some confusion to the, uh, uh, to the signal. The thing is, um, those, those galactic binaries that are millions uh, of them in the Milky Way. But we cannot resolve all of them. Uh, we can resolve about 20,000 of them. So, uh, so the rest, which have uh, uh, typically a uh, um, uh, lower signal-to-noise ratio, those will uh, contribute to the confusion. Yes, yeah, so, so, so that's, uh, that's an artifact of the simulation, that uh, you cannot really simulate millions and millions of signals. So, uh, so, so that's, a, that's a fraction of what's resolvable, and you would just plotted the, the loudest ones. Yeah. Yes? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. So those are those are the different harmonics, right? So so um, so the signal is uh, uh, is described as a sum of the different harmonics of the or orbital phase. So so this one will be uh, n equals one. So it's the Right, this one is n equals two, that's the dominant, then you have n equals three, four, five. They have different frequency response. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> Wait, this one? Yeah, uh, so, so that's... Um, uh, that's what we need to uh, uh, to be able to detect the signal. We need uh, we need the signal to be loud enough uh, for us to uh, to dis disentangle it from the noise, and that's uh, that's a choice. Um, that's a choice that's been made. So um, it depends really. It depends really on the. Uh, on how complicated the signal is. If you have a very simple signal, uh, then you can, um, uh, you can detect it um, more easily, so you, 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 need, uh, you need a lower signal-to-noise ratio. So typically, galactic binaries, those are monochromatic, so they have the, the simplest sig signal you can think of, so you can uh, uh, you can detect them as uh, at low SNRs like that, but uh, EMRIs, for example, those are, those have very very complicated signals, and the signal to noise ratio that you need to uh, to make a detection is more of the order 15, 20 uh, things uh, things like that. Yes. I'm so, I'm sorry. Can, can you speak loud? Yes. Would it be difficult to expand or 
move according to the what source we want to yeah make. yeah uh, no so so the the uh, the detector is made up by three satellites in orbit around the sun uh, and the the orbits are chosen in such a way that the uh, the configuration stays as close to an equilateral triangle uh, as possible. But uh, during, the, uh, during the year, and you, you'll see in, uh, uh, I think, the next to next slide, um, the, the, the orientation of the detector changes during the year. So, so the, the, uh, the triangle rotates like that as it rotates around the sun. Uh, and that gives you information on the uh, on the sky location of your source. Right, and finally we have uh, um, uh, so LIGO type uh, binary uh, black holes. Uh, early in there in there in spiral, they will also be present in the LISA data. Uh, it, goes typically up to one hertz. Uh, and so those are um, uh, kind of uh, uh, traces of um, uh, the, the frequency evolution of the, um, uh, of the strain of the signal. So a few of those will also be detectable by LISA uh, early in the spiral. And yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that depends on the mass of the accretion disk. But uh, I think that uh, typically you expect that the uh, that the accretion disk will not have a, a, a much higher mass than the black hole itself. So the, uh, the space time will be dominated by the black hole, not the accretion disk. So, uh, uh, so at, at leading order, the signal will uh, just be um, uh, uh, just uh, uh, be um, generated by the, by the black holes in the binary. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, that's a good question. I'm uh, I'm not a specialist, but uh, uh, from what from what I've gathered, um, I don't think people are re really worried about uh, the effect of accretion disk. Um, maybe well on the gravitational wave signal itself. Um, uh, maybe maybe it will be important for uh, especially for really uh, loud signals like this one. Uh, because in that case, you can resolve very, very fine details of your gravitational waveform. But, um, uh, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so in the um, uh, in the waveform modeling community for Elisa, I don't think this has really been addressed uh, uh, specifically. But. Yes. Yeah. 
All right. So, uh, so this is an overview of all the, the Lisa sources. Uh, so, so one uh, uh, one final thing is that uh, this noise curve, this noise curve, you see, has a um, a particular shape, and uh, uh, one other difference with uh, uh, ground-based detectors is that. Um, here, you, your gravitational wavelength that you're, uh, uh, that you're interested in is comparable to the, uh, uh, to the light travel time between uh, the satellites. So, so the response will also be affected by, the, by this fact. Um, uh, those effects here, those are all due to the finite arm length of the, the detector. Right, so, so here there are um, different science targets uh, specifically for, uh, for LISA. Um, so you see uh, uh, galactic binaries here in this region of the frequency band. Um, so stochastic background. Um, uh, all these things that we're, uh, we hope to, to measure with, with LISA. Um, and um, uh, so yes, so here in the uh, in the low frequency range, you see merger uh, mergers of Milky Way type galaxies. Those are our uh, supermassive black hole mergers. So uh, so how far uh, can we see our signals? So the, uh, depending on the mass, uh, and this, uh, so, so we have to assume a, a mass ratio for, for this plot as well. Um, uh, this assumes a mass ratio of one to three. Uh, and depending on the total mass uh, of the system, uh, you can go, uh, you can see in, uh, at the very, very high redshifts, uh, especially between like 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 7 solar masses, you can reach redshifts of, uh, of 20 and more. Uh, and uh, here in stars, the, uh, the stars um, are, uh, they correspond to, uh, uh, to typical science targets. Uh, so this is uh, this here is uh, uh, one of the most relevant for our for our lectures uh, for this uh, workshop. The, uh, so this is uh, a Milky Way type galaxy mergers. So two uh, two supermassive black holes comparable to a Sagittarius A star merging at redshift of two. Uh, and you see here in colors, those correspond to different signal-to-noise ratios. So, uh, so at, at this uh, distance, uh, for, for this kind of mass, you, you can reach signal-to-noise ratios of uh, 3,000 here. Uh, but also in a very uh, uh, early universe, here at redshift 20, if you have uh, um, supermassive black hole mergers of a uh, mass of 10 to the 5. Uh, we can also detect them in with uh, really high uh, signal-to-noise ratios as well. All right, so first, uh, uh, a sketch. Uh, so this is to... Um, uh, uh, to stress the differences between uh, a ground-based gravitational wave detector and a space-based uh, gravitational, gravitational wave detector. So uh, here uh, on the ground, uh, what we do is we, uh, we shoot a laser uh, and we, we split the, the laser beam into two parts here uh, and those 
those two lasers go into cavities, the signals bounce uh, this way and this way uh, several times, and then they get uh, reflected and we observe an interference pattern uh, uh, here in this uh, uh, photoreceptor. Uh, so for, for this kind of, uh, of detector, we have a, a, a fixed, uh, fixed arm length. Uh, we have a fixed geometry. This, uh, the, uh, this doesn't change during, um, uh, during uh, the, uh, the observation. We have a single laser that we shoot in two different directions and we recombine the signal. Uh, and for, uh, the signals are um, short-lived enough that we can uh, assume the detector is static. Put ish here because it's, uh, it's true for, uh, um, uh, for uh, high-mass black holes. But uh, if you look at uh, neutron star binaries, um, those have signals that last uh, much longer. Uh, and the, the rotation of the Earth in, in, these, uh, uh, in this situation is, uh, has to be taken into account. But, um, yeah, right. but for, for some sources, you can assume the detector is static. In space, uh, we do things differently. Uh, so what we do is we uh, um, make up a constellation of uh, three spacecrafts uh, that, uh, so for, for LISA, those three spacecraft orbit around the sun. Uh, and, the, and in each spacecraft, you have uh, two optical benches here with uh, two test masses. Uh, and you have uh, several lasers in each spacecraft that uh, emit a light that uh, bounces off the test mass and then is sent to the other spacecraft. Uh, and you have one, um, uh, uh, you have one half of the spacecraft that talks to uh, one, uh, one of the others, and uh, the other half talks to the other, um, the third uh, spacecraft in the constellation. We, uh, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, reflect the, uh, the light emitted by this laser at the other spacecraft that will be about eight light seconds uh, away uh, and recombine it with the, uh, with the, with the laser itself uh, because the, the distance are just too, too big. But, um, but what we can do is we can uh, receive, uh, receive the signal from the other spacecraft and measure, uh, measure its phase. And we also measure the phase of the, of the light signal that we, that we sent, uh, when we sent it. And by making combinations of these uh, different phase measurements, we can reconstruct artificially um, uh, in interference, uh, interference patterns uh, in our detector. Uh, so, uh, so another difference is that the, um, uh, the constellation is not a perfect equilateral tri triangle. The arm length uh, vary uh, during the year. Uh, they are not equal to each other. Uh, the geometry varies, so the, the opening angle of the, um, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of these two light signals changes slightly during the year as well. Uh, you have multiple uh, lasers uh, uh, whose phase, phases you have to recombine. Uh, and your detector is, uh, is moving uh, during your, uh, your observation. So its, um, it's response will uh, also depend on time. So uh, now let's try to, uh, to express 
um, the, uh, uh, the response to, to the detector. So, so um, in order to do this, uh, uh, and in order to recreate our uh, interference patterns, we need to uh, we need to develop a new technique uh, that we call time delay interferometry, uh, and that's uh, what I'm going to talk about for the rest of today. So uh, uh, one important factor is that um, uh, so you have different noise sources in a detector. We'll see this uh, uh, in more detail tomorrow. Uh, but the important thing is that the, uh, 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 the phase noise of the, of the laser is really the dominant component um, uh, in your signal. Uh, and the idea is to, uh, is to combine different measurements taken at different times uh, in order to cancel out this, uh, uh, this noise component. Uh, so, the, so in order to get the response, let's look at um, how uh, the, the phase of a, uh, of a laser signal is, um, uh, is modified by a gravitational wave that passes through its, uh, its path. So what we measure is, uh, uh, as I said, it's really uh, laser phases. So the, uh, the phase uh, acquired along the path is uh, simply uh, given by this, um, this relation. So it's the integral of the, of the frequency along the path. Equivalently, you can uh, uh, divide by, the, by your uh, uh, frequency and talk about an optical path length, just given by the integral dt along your path. So if you, if you assume that you have a gravitational wave that uh, travels in the z direction, you can write the, the metric, uh, assuming you're in a Minkowski space and you have a perturbation due to a gravitational wave. Uh, so you can write it in, in two forms. You can write it with uh, uh, Minkowski uh, variables, or you can change uh, to use retarded time and advanced time, in which case your, uh, um, uh, your wave perturbation uh, depends only on the, on the reti retarded time, uh, which makes this uh, very useful for the following. Uh, and you know that your uh, uh, light sig signal travels along a null geodesic, so your uh, ds square will be zero. So you can rewrite these uh, equations uh, like this. So you can express uh, dt square in terms of uh, dx, dy, dz uh, with your uh, uh, gravitational wave perturbations, perturbation, which um, doesn't have any uh, components in the, uh, in, the uh, in time. So h zero mu is uh, is zero, right? Okay. So uh, we can try to uh, parameterize our path. Uh, if we assume that it's uh, it's emitted. Uh, at some uh, at some space-time coordinate x alpha of zero, it's received uh, at another x alpha of one. You can parameterize the path, um, uh, neg neglecting uh, the effect of the gravitational wave uh, in this way, just linearly, with um, uh, x alpha of lambda being given by this, with the uh, um, with the difference will be the, uh, the arm length uh, vector like this. So then along the photon path, you can, uh, uh, you can use this relation here 
to, to express dt as a function of d lambda. Uh, uh, and it's given, uh, it's given like this, and you can re-express this uh, in terms of uh, L0. Uh, L0 is the, the, the length uh, of the path in the absence of a gravitational wave. And the modification due to the gravitational waves is, is going to be given by this, uh, this relation here. So it's, uh, it depends on the uh, contraction of the gravitational wave tensor with the, um, uh, the spatial part of the, um, uh, of the difference between your, uh, your reception uh, position and your emission position. Right. Okay. So we can, uh, since H, A, B is really small, we can expand this uh, at linear order in H, and we can carry out this integral dt. Uh, we can replace it by a, uh, simply an in integral on the affine parameter, like this. And this will be uh, our optical path length. So this will be proportional to the effect that the gravitational wave has on the phase of the photon that we, that we measure in our detector once it's uh, traveled along one arm. So we can then uh, re-express this integral d lambda uh, by using the, uh, the retarded time uh, since uh, HAB only depends on uh, the retarded time u, we can change this integral uh, d lambda as an integral du. And the, the extra factor that we acquire here, this uh, uh, 1 minus uh, z uh, hat dot r hat, this is... Um, this expresses the, the, the difference in the retarded time uh, at emission and the retarded time at reception of the, um, uh, uh, of, the uh, of the light beam. So, so this here, this is the, the, the response that we can, uh, that we can model. Um, in our detector for a signal that travels along one arm. Uh, now, yes? This? So, yeah, so, so this is, uh, um, uh, so this UR, this is the retarded time at the recep at reception, okay? Uh, and delta u is the difference between the retarded time at reception and the retarded time at emission. I could have put uh, ue here, but um, yeah. Okay, so we can uh, 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 we can simplify a bit our response by uh, going to the the Fourier domain. So we uh, define the Fourier transform of uh, our wave uh, like so. Uh, and then, uh, by, uh, by re replacing this uh, by its, uh, the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform, uh, we can write uh, the, um, uh, the difference in, uh, uh, well, the difference in optical path length, uh, which is just this, this term here. Uh, by an integral in frequency of uh, your uh, wave Fourier transform uh, times some, uh, uh, some response function with uh, some tra transfer function, which uh, takes this form and includes the, uh, um, uh, the uh, terms that d 
depend on the retarded uh, on the um, on the propagation direction uh, and some uh, uh, some extra factor here, which cor which corresponds to a, uh, uh, a a difference in retarded time between a fixed point. Um, uh, for example, the solar system barycenter, in our case, and the position of the satellite that uh, received the light signal at this time. Right. So in particular, if we assume that we have a uh, monochromatic uh, signal, uh, so this will work for uh, monochromatic signals, but if you have a signal that's in a stationary phase approximation, uh, it will be uh, uh, very, very similar. So you can compute the uh, Fourier transform of this signal very easily. You get uh, um, a sum of uh, delta functions uh, of f minus f0. So you can, you can compute this, this integral uh, quite easily, and uh, what you get is in the end is uh, um, your transfer function times uh, some uh, uh, the geometrical factor of your gravitational waves contracted to, uh, to the, um, uh, the arm length uh, unit vector uh, at, the, uh, at the time where you made the measurement. Uh, and some extra, uh, uh, the same extra phase factor we had uh, previously. All right. So this is this is how we model uh, a um, the effect of a gravitational wave uh, in a uh, uh, in a, um, a signal that's traveled along one arm. Uh, and next, we'll see uh, how we combine how we combine those signals to uh, uh, to build up a um, uh, an interference uh, uh, pattern. So uh, 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 let's look at the the, the orbits of the uh, ESA spacecraft uh, shortly. So the, the um, uh, as I said previously, those are chosen so that the, the, the configuration is as close to a, an equilateral triangle uh, along the, the, whole, uh, the whole year. Uh, they, uh, they orbit the sun uh, at, the same, uh, at the same distance uh, as the Earth, so at uh, one astronomical astronomical unit, uh, and we, we choose the inclination and the eccentricity of the, of the orbit uh, such that uh, we get our uh, chosen uh, mean arm length uh, here, um, and uh, this choice of inclination, um, uh, de uh, dependent on the eccentricity will keep the spacecraft in an almost equilateral uh, triangle. So the arm length will be uh, constant at, at leading order. Uh, so it's the, the, um, it's the ecliptic. Right? It's the inclination with respect to the ecliptic. Because we, yeah. So the 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 barycenter of the um, uh, of the constellation, so the barycenter of the three satellites, will stay uh, will train behind the Earth uh, at uh, a few degrees uh, distance, maybe 10, 20 degrees uh, behind. Uh, but it will stay on the ecliptic. It will uh, stay on the same orbit as the Earth. Yes. R is uh, one astronomical unit. It's the it's the uh, R is the it's the um, uh, 
uh, it's the mean uh, distance to the to the sun. Um, right. Uh, right, and uh, uh, and also you you place the perihelia of the uh, uh, of the orbits of the three satellites uh, equally spaced um, uh, along the ecliptic. Uh, so if you if you uh, uh, choose your orbits like this, uh, then we, you will have uh, an almost equilateral uh, triangle configuration along the whole year. Um, so uh, here, uh, here it says uh, it's chosen 19 to 23 degrees. So the the, the choice, um, uh, so this uh, this choice is made. So you want uh, you want the constellation to be as close to the Earth as possible in order to uh, facilitate the data transmission from the satellite to the Earth. But you want to be, uh, you you want it to be as far away from the Earth as possible, in order to uh, reduce perturbations uh, to the orbits from the Earth. So you have to um, uh, you have to optimize uh, those two those two factors, and uh, uh, twenty degrees is uh, is good enough. Right. So the um, uh, so you you see here uh, uh, the orbits of the the satellites along the year. Sorry. Uh, so you so the the triangle uh, the triangle rotates uh, along its axis uh, along the year and it, and it rotates around the sun. Uh, and the plane uh, the plane of the detector uh, in this configuration is that. A sixty de degree angle with the uh, with the ecliptic. Right. So, um, um, as we uh, uh, try to uh, describe our uh, our different signals, uh, let's make some conventions. So these are the three satellites. Uh, in the LISA constellation uh, that we name one, two, and three, uh, the, uh, we will have um, six different uh, measurements, six different phase measurements of uh, a signal that's been emitted from one satellite and, uh, and observed at another. Uh, and we, we label them um, uh, with respect to the to the opposite uh, spacecraft, so L two will be from spacecraft one to spacecraft three, right? And we put uh, uh, we put the prime uh, in the uh, counterclockwise direction here, and the unprime in the uh, in the clockwise direction. So uh, the the arm length they they depend on time they're different from each other, uh, but they uh, they they depend on the specificities of the the orbits of the satellites. So the 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 eccentricity that I um, that I mentioned here, if you put in the uh, Lisa values, so this will be um, uh, two point five. Gigameters, that's about 8.34 seconds, and R is one, um, uh, one astro astronomical unit, that's about 500 seconds. So the eccentricity is of order 5, 10 to the minus 3. So it's a, it's a small quantity, and we can expand our orbits um, uh, in this small quantity. Uh, and those will depend on the uh, spacecraft velocities. Uh, omega r here, omega is uh, uh, the frequency of one over a year. That's the 
orbital frequency of the satellites, uh, and uh, the velocities of, uh, are of order 10 to the minus 4, similar to the velocity of the Earth. Uh, so if you, uh, if you plug all this in your uh, inclined eccentric Keplerian orbit, and you try to compute the, uh, 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 the arm length, so, so the arms, uh, the arms will be given uh, uh, so if you uh, for example you measure uh, uh, L3 here uh, you measure L3 so uh, this is uh, satellite number one so uh, sorry so L3 will be given by uh, the position of satellite one uh, at time t, where you measure your signal, uh, minus the position of satellite two uh, uh, at the time where it was emitted, uh, and it was it was emitted at time t minus the uh, light travel time along the, along the arm. Uh, so this is how, how you, you compute your, your arm length. And at leading order in, in E and in omega r, it's just a constant. Uh, but there are, um, uh, there are different, uh, 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 there are different perturbations to that, uh, uh, to that quantity. And um, uh, so at, at leading order constant equal, uh, the leading order correction uh, to that is uh, the, the term proportional to the eccentricity. And it leads to a still constant but unequal arm length. So, um, uh, L3 and L2 will be different. Uh, and if you take into account the spacecraft velocities, the, the, uh, the arm length will further depend on time. Uh, and these are three levels of approximations that we can use to uh, construct uh, time delay interferometry variables, which we, we use as uh, our um, uh, our uh, interference interference measurements. So um, a bit of uh, bit of notation here. So uh, uh, we call uh, y i j k. This will be the measurement uh, along uh, one arm, uh, and we write i. Uh, the, so the first index corresponds to the spacecraft where the signal originates. The last index corresponds to where the signal is measured. Uh, and the middle index corresponds to the arm along which the signal propagates. So for example, uh, this signal here, this will be Y231. And then this one will be y one three prime two. Right. So so the the whole idea of time delay interferometry is uh, to reduce the the laser phase noise uh, in the um, uh, in our measurements. Uh, so for that we need a, we need a model for this noise and. Um, uh, the different combinations of phase measurements that we uh, that we make to construct these uh, these variables here, they will result in an, uh, in a noise component in a, in a laser phase noise component in y i j k, uh, depending on three functions, uh, like this. So uh, phi i of 
t minus l, so y i j k will be phi i of t minus l j of t minus phi k of t. So, um, at first level of approximation, we can assume, uh, we assume that uh, our arm length are equal and constant. So it means that uh, um, we can uh, construct a time delay operator, uh, dx, that, um, uh, that applies on some function of uh, some, some function x of t, uh, like this. It will, uh, so dx will just be x measured at time t minus l, where l is our uh, arm length of our detector. So one, uh, one kind of thing we can do and, uh, is to construct a, a, a signal that's um, close to a Michelson interferometer. So what I mean by this is if I write down, if I put the triangle here, one, two, three. So we combine y, two, three, one. That's going from two and going to, to one. So we make this measurement, uh, this measurement here at time t at spacecraft one. Uh, and the second term is uh, y one, three prime two. So it starts from one, it goes to two. And since we take a time delay here, uh, this, this signal will, will be measured here uh, um, at time t minus l, where L is the propagation time of this signal. So in effect, uh, what, we, um, what we've constructed here is um, uh, a signal that uh, starts, at, um, starts at spacecraft one, is bounced off as spacecraft two, and is measured back as the spacecraft one. And we, uh, we subtract to this signal, uh, uh, this quantity, y3, 2, 1. So it starts at 3, measured at 1. Uh, and same thing, we subtract uh, a time delayed y1, 2, 3. So 1, 2, 3, starts at 1, ends at 3. And uh, since we've taken a time delay here, uh, this corresponds to a, a signal that starts here, it's bounced off at spacecraft three and is measured at spacecraft one. So in this sense, uh, these, um, uh, these uh, uh, variables here, mx, correspond to a, a reconstructed Michelson interferometer. Right. Uh, so if we make the equilateral triangle assumption, we can check that the um, uh, that the noise in uh, uh, that the noise the laser noise in M X indeed cancels. And then uh, by by symmetry we can build two similar. Uh, time delay interferometry combinations, MY and MZ, by just permutating the indices. So uh, MY uh, will be the same thing, but around spacecraft two instead of spacecraft one. And MZ will be the same thing around spacecraft three. Right. So this is all well and good, but uh, uh, 
the, the arm lengths are, are not really constant, they're not really equal. So if we relax the assumption that the arm lengths are equal, uh, we need to, uh, uh, we need to uh, look at a slightly more complicated signal. So first we define a time delay operator like this. So this will correspond to a time delay uh, along arm i to, uh, that we write like this. So x comma i will just be x of t minus l i. Well, um, um, so in this, um, uh, in this level of approximation, we, uh, we relax the assumption that the arm lengths are equal, but we, we, we're still assuming that they are constant during one, uh, one uh, measurement. So um, we assume the constellation is static on the uh, light travel around the constellation time scale. The, uh, the arm lengths are equal in both directions, so Li prime equals Li, and the time delay operators commute. Uh, so in that, um, in that, uh, uh, if, if, we, if we use the same, uh, if we use the same uh, combinations, uh, as we had previously, uh, uh, the laser phase noise will no longer cancel because uh, the travel time for this path will be different from the travel time from this path because the arms are not equal. But we can use a, a slightly more complicated combination uh, like this. So x, uh, sorry, x here is a combination of eight different single arm measurements uh, with uh, between zero and three time delays. And they also correspond to a, uh, they also correspond to a, a sort of reconstructed uh, signal, a difference between two reconstructed signals. So uh, uh, x will be the difference between this path here and this path here. So you bounce off one arm and then you bounce off the other and you sub subtract the signal uh, uh, that you're re you've reconstructed so, so such that you first bounce off the other and then uh, the first arm. All right, so we can check that in this assumption, so since the, uh, uh, the time delays uh, in, in both directions are equal and they all commute with each other, uh, then the noise also cancels. We can also buy, uh, build two similar combinations, y and z, by a permutation of the indices, like we did uh, before. Uh, so, um, so that's all good, but um, uh, if we relax the assumption uh, that the uh, that the spacecraft are static, uh, then we can no longer uh, cancel the noise like this. Uh, but we, we can still uh, construct, um, uh, we can still construct uh, a, a, a different uh, TDI variables uh, that will have uh, the noise almost cancel uh, in those combinations. So if we define the uh, time delay operator that uh, now depends on time, uh, and uh, you, you combine two uh, time delay operators like this, and from this expression, you can see that they uh, 
uh, they don't commute anymore. So in this case, the, uh, you need to build uh, more complicated uh, ones. Uh, like this, a combination of 16 different uh, uh, measurements. So, so that's a bit more complicated, but that's still the same idea. Uh, is that you, you, you combine uh, what you had in the previous generation here. Uh, so you, uh, so you, in this case, you would go bounce off here, and then here, and then back there, and then back here, uh, and subtract uh, doing the same thing the, uh, in the opposite way. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, if you, use, uh, if you use the exact arm length uh, from your Keplerian orbit, the, the residual laser noise in the detector uh, is, is just this commutator. And this commutator corresponds to um, really going one way and going the other. So that's the second generation TDI variables. The, um, and those will be uh, those will be really essential um, when we want to uh, to work with real LISA data, uh, because in that case we we don't have a, uh, we don't have a control over our signal. It's just what's physically measured, uh, and in that case we really need to go to that level of uh, precision in order to. Uh, reduce the noise to an acceptable level. Uh, but if we're, if we're making simulations uh, before, uh, before the mission in order to, to make some predictions about what we can do, this is, this is, not, um, this is not necessary. We can use uh, the, the simple uh, single round trip variables, um, simple Michelsons like that. All right. Um, yes. Yes. Sorry? Yeah, the arm lengths are changing. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, well, you you know where your spacecrafts are, right? So, so, so you know how the uh, arm length changes with uh, with respect to time along the orbit, right? Maybe I'm not understanding your question. Yeah, you can you you can't be build a thing that will uh, yes that's right you 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 cannot uh, exactly cancel your uh, your noise because you you uh, you're not really bouncing off lasers like this. Uh, what you're doing is that yeah you measure the face here and you measure measure the face here uh, and you measure it there. And you combine all those measurements uh, at different times uh, in such a way that you, you, you reduce your, your noise uh, as low as possible. But you can, you can, never, you can never reduce it um, exactly. Because uh, uh, what you're uh, what you're doing here is that you're you're uh, you're taking taking more and more uh, time delay operators one after the other, uh, but since they don't commute, uh, you know, those time delay operators will not um, cancel exactly because you've taken them in different orders. Right. Sir? Yes. So yeah, so so 
uh, these come really from uh, from there. So so in here you have uh, two lasers per spacecraft, uh, and what you do uh, those depend really on on how the optical benches are set up, and how and um, uh, how the signals are are combined, because. Uh, um, you see here that you're making four, uh, four phase measurements in, in each spa spacecraft. Uh, so in total, you have 12. Uh, and you combine uh, those 12 measurements uh, into, uh, into six different combinations. And those six different combinations, you've built them in such a way that the, uh, the laser noise in each of them uh, uh, depends on three different uh, noise functions, like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it 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 really depends on how uh, how exactly the uh, uh, the the measurements are combined to to create those uh, those variables. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, it's so. So uh, it's just sent once and it's received once. It's it's not bounced off, but uh, it it is it is quite wide. Um, of course, you're you're trying to um, you're trying to reduce the, the the width of your beam, but it's. Um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, several. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so, so at the at the beginning of the mission, uh, when the first crafts are first set into orbit, uh, the thing that you will need to do is to to orient your detector in such a way that they they really look at the uh, at the others, and for that uh, you're you're using the the light signal uh, itself. So you so you try to change your your, the orientation of your spacecraft in, in such a way that you do receive a signal from the, from the other satellites. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the first phase of the mission. That's the, the locking of the arms. Um, like that. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think that's, uh, that's probably what we will do, yes. Yeah, we will... Uh, first, get a signal and then try to adjust to, uh, in order to maximize the strength of the signal so that you're really in the center of your beam. This doesn't affect the, the, the phase in the present measurement? Um, it, it does contribute to the, to the phase error measurements, for, for sure. Uh, but the hope is that you can, you can know your spacecraft position uh, accurately enough that you can uh, uh, that you can play this whole game and subtract and combine all your phase measurements in in such a way that the residual phase noise is way below the um, uh, the contributions of the other uh, uh, of all the other uh, noise uh, uh, contributions right uh, Yes, uh, I was going to talk about that tomorrow, but uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll show show that tomorrow. The, the um, uh, so the the really the res residual phase noise in uh, <coughs> when you really compute things properly, uh, you will have uh, so so in all of these variables you have three main components. You have the, the shot noise, which is uh, independent in each of the uh, <coughs> single arm measurements here. You have the acceleration noise, which uh, depends on, uh, uh, which depends on the, uh, the displacement noise of the test masses. 
Uh, and then you have the, this laser phase noise, which dominates everything. But, uh, uh, but in, in each of those, you can, uh, uh, in each of those variables, you can compute what the uh, different combinations, uh, noise uh, contributions of each of those components is, uh, and how they vary depending on the, uh, uh, the kind of time delay that you use. If you, uh, if you combine your measurements using a, a constant equal time delay or constant unequal time delay or, uh, or exact time delays. Right. All right. Well, uh, yeah, so, so I have five minutes left. I think it's a, it's a good place to stop now. See, I'm at 2472. That's uh, that's pretty nice for the first of three lectures. Uh, yeah. So, uh, do you have other questions? Yes. Sorry. Uh, ah, how do we choose the arm length? Yes. Well, oh, how accurately does it have to be measured? Um, Yes, uh, very accurately. <laughs> uh, the, so, so the yeah. So, so you you you're trying to to um, uh, to reduce your noise level by a dozen order of magnitude. Uh, and in order to do that, you 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 really need to know your position um, better than a meter. I would I would assume. Uh, but um, um, but yeah, if you have inaccuracies in your in your measurements, you, um, uh, it's very, really really hard uh, to uh, uh, to reduce your your, your noise level at um, uh, sufficient uh, sufficiently. Um, yeah. So the accuracy that you require is is uh, um, uh, the level at which you try to reduce your uh, laser phase noise, and uh, uh, so yeah, I think um, yeah, I, th uh, I think I'm I'm pretty sure you need sub meter precision for the for the spacecraft positions. Uh, yeah? So, so has now the Lisa science team uh, implemented yes. the Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah, so so there is a, a going on uh, right now a Lisa data challenge. So this is a, a simulated data uh, that's sent around and uh, People who model the LISA signals try to recover the data from the, uh, try to recover the parameters of the signal that's injected in, into this mock data. And uh, what, uh, what they use, um, they use these variables uh, here. Because it's, it's only simulated data, so you don't need to, uh, uh, you don't need to reduce the laser phase noise if you don't inject it. So, uh, uh, so those one, uh, those variables are are enough. And yes, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, yeah, yes. Uh. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, so so uh, that that comes from the geometry of the of the orbits. So the the orbits are, are chosen uh, like this. So uh, the the inclination of the uh, of the single uh, orbit is um, proportional to the to the eccentricity of the orbit. So if you um, uh, if you write down carefully your your Keplerian orbits for for these uh, satellites, you see that the the, the triangle stays uh, more or less at a sixty degree inclination. 
but uh, but yeah, that's that's given by this choice of uh, inclination. Yeah, stability is uh, is important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ah, it's it's no, it's not in a Lagrange point. Uh, right. So so it will be affected. Yes, it will be affected from all the from the from the Earth, from the Moon, from uh, uh, from other objects that uh, pass nearby. Uh, so. So yeah, uh, it would be nice. It would be nice to put them in the Lagrange points for extra stability. That's right. But uh, it's very far away, and then you will have problems with uh, communication with your satellites. So uh, so so um, the choice has been made not to put them uh, that far away, uh, just to to make uh, communication easier. Readjusted. Hmm? Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely, yes, yes. And that, and that's one of the uh, one of the major factors that uh, reduce the lifetime of the mission is uh, how much fuel you're taken with you and uh, for how long you can adjust your orbits so that they stay uh, in this configuration. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't understand. <laughs> yes. So, uh, with the laser beams, like uh, yes. sending or measuring the uh, light. So, for example, if you get this x one, some uh, point x one. I think uh, yeah. So uh, we can. So you told like we can have a point where there is no. Uh, we can create a zero noise point, right? Uh, yeah, uh, zero noise point of uh, maybe the next. Yeah, zero. No so. Uh, oh, you mean uh, you mean these ones? Yes. Right. So um, if uh, can be can this can be used to fix the interferometer the arms of the interferometer itself or because like. Can also adjust the arms in such a way that this po there is a point where this cancels or something like that. Right. right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, so no. Um, unfortunately, because uh, uh, you really want your um, you really want your uh, test masses to be freely falling uh, in order to make your measurements. And if your uh, test masses are freely falling, then they follow the Keplerian orbits, um, the full Keplerian orbits. Uh, and the full Keplerian orbits are, uh, are such that the, the arm length are not, uh, not really constant. Uh, and if you try to correct for that and keep your, your, um, uh, your arms constant, then your test masses are no longer freely falling. So, yeah. 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 Yes. 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 As uh, yes. Um, as closely as pos possible. Yes. Uh, and and there is some uh, talk uh, about. So so I'm not really an expert on that, but there's some talk about about um, uh, locking the phase of one laser with respect to the phase of the other. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure exact, exactly uh, how uh, all of this works. But you can do this to a, to a certain degree, right? Your your lasers are not perfect, and your uh, phase measurements are not perfect either. So. Um, 
so yeah, but that's uh, yeah, that's uh, an interesting point. Yes. 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 The noise is in the phase measurements. It's it's, um, uh, it's a noise that's due to the fact that your your laser is not uh, is not exactly uh, uh, well. It's not a perfect uh, laser. Um, so, so, so uh, like luminescence. Yes. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah. So, so the phase difference uh, between those two lasers. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is uh, taken into account at the at the very beginning. This enters the 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 first um, the first single arm uh, variable here. This is a const uh, This is a combination of phase measurements from from different lasers uh, already. Um, I think it, each one of those is a combination uh, uh, between phase measurements from four lasers each. Right. Um, but yeah, they, these are uh, made up of phase measurements taken at different times and uh, subtracted with each other. Um, but yeah. Yes. It's it's yeah it 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 it's really built uh, so that uh, these variables that you've constructed from your phase measurements, those have some uh, phase noise, some laser phase noise, and these variables are are constructed in such a way that uh, if you modeled your residual phase noise correctly, uh, like this. And your phase noise really de um, uh, in each of your measurements are really correlated uh, in the way um, uh, that's described here. Then, in that case, the laser, the residual laser phase noise in the TDI variables will be uh, much below uh, the other noise sources. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh...